welcome to everyone, uh, including uh, um, uh, our panelists and uh, people who are joining from different part of the world. So as, as far as we are now, there are 150 people joining and, uh, and we have about uh, um, uh, more than 300 registrations. So hopefully there is a lot of interest um, in this topic. Um, my name is, as I said, as I mentioned, Dr. Minshad Ali Ansari. I'm a, a chairman of World Bioproduction Forum, uh, which was created in 2019 uh, to connect industry and academia for novel innovation. So that uh, is a nonprofit organization as very much um, a stepping in, in this area and, and, and wants to help to the biocontrol industry. Biopesticide Summit uh, is a platform where basically uh, we, we are organizing uh, this uh, and other events. Uh, the first event was um, took place in 2019 and was quite successful. So, so the World Bioproduction Forum is again, is, is, a, is a nonprofit organization as very much uh, uh, working towards um, connecting academia and, uh, and industry for innovation. Innovation is not the topic today, but uh, innovation uh, is very much uh, the area where we are looking for. Now, as Sarah mentioned that this is very much uh, timely and uh, we will be discussing today why regulatory reform of biopesticide is needed and is this right time um, and, and what we can do um, and, and, and where actually the progress has been made. So on that topic, actually, we'll be looking from now and until, and, until 12 o'clock. Uh, there is, a, a, as mentioned, that uh, uh, top class speakers are here. Uh, who is going to shed light on this one. Now, before I uh, want to explain my uh, thoughts, um, I would like to thank to uh, some of the uh, supporters uh, who actually um, has put forward their, um, their, their interest and, and actually had the uh, thanking to the Sara as well, who was actually behind the, the field and the running all the show. Now, I also would like to thank the media partners who actually have, have, have disseminated this news to widely as possible, uh, and, and which is actually, we are seeing a lot of interest is coming here. Now, so why regulatory reform is needed and, and why basically uh, I think, and some of uh, colleagues actually are, are, are basically looking for. The first of all, we have seen a, a, a lot of, uh, uh, the toxic basically or harmful chemical uh, has been removed from the markets, which means there is a, uh, there is, there is a gap and that gap need to be filled by uh, products such as the bioplasticide or any other products. We have also seen in the recent uh, uh, year is that demand for organic food production has increased. Uh, you might have noticed that the Vetros, Sainsbury, uh, Tesco, all this basically wants to have some foods in their shelf. But unfortunately, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a very limited area where you will notice that there is an organic food uh, it, it, it basically uh, there. So that, that area need to increase. So that area is not even the 1% in supermarket. Uh, and the reason is that we have a very limited uh, biopesticide product registered in the European and, 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 and basically when we talk about more in the EU uh, later on. And the reason is basically is very much a lengthy process and costly registration process. And, and you see that uh, it is taking more than five years um, and we only have a 60 products compared to uh, 2.1 year roughly or two years in US, which is an EPA system and uh, where there is a 200 products is already there in the market. We have seen that uh, the, our industry actually is very much led by uh, SMEs, those are actually uh, working and bringing uh, innovation. However, because of these um, two things, uh, it's very difficult for them to bring the product or commercialize the market. Uh, I mean, I have my personal experience in, the, in, in, in this as well, and I'm really uh, very much uh, uh, looking forward to how to, to change the system so that uh, more product we can bring in the market. Now, these are very serious issues uh, which industry is facing uh, in terms of uh, when, when we, we are looking for, for investment. Investors are all, always looking for uh, uh, a, a bigger market. And again, because of the niche market, we don't have a billion uh, market. So we are still very much uh, 
synchronized to the millions when we do in them in very much in, 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 in sector wise. So th this is a core issue, uh, how this is going to happen. Yes, when you will have a more product with more commercialization and market will increase. Uh, we knew that there, are, there has been uh, uh, progress made uh, by, by particularly International Biocontrol Manufacturing Association, IBMA, for the last 25 years. Uh, these progress are actually uh, very much uh, uh, there, and, and, uh, and, uh, and there is a lot of, I think, uh, need to be done in, in, in the future. Now, very quickly, when we see that where we are in terms of uh, 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 market, uh, and as you see, um, that Europe is still has a 27.7% uh, share compared to 35.3% in the American market. Although size is basically is more or less the same. The rest of the world is actually, actually increasing, as you see the Asia and, 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 and which has a 21%. Uh, and, and then when you compare these figures to, to UK wise, where the more talk is going to be, we are only 18.8% .8 compared to, to Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, where basically they are still uh, have a higher percentage. The UK got is still a serious issue. Although we have a very much classical biological control system in the glass houses, but we still we are basically not utilizing more uh, products in a polytunnel and in, and 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 the sector and the area where the biological products actually works. Now, in the last uh, about 12 years, you see the UK scenario, we have about 30 uh, active ingredients. Uh, there might be one or two recently uh, resistor, which is not in the database, but this is very, very limited when we compare to, uh, to chemical products where we have a 450 active ingredients. So it's a very much a fraction of products is, is available in the market. Now, when we see the products comparison is 200 versus 60 product in European Union, I think the only one thing we are looking for the complexity. If we remove this complexity, then hopefully the system will work and there will be more products in the market. And it's very much like an elephant in the room, what we do in, 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 in that scenario. Uh, 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 and and, and, and so it's, it's, it's a very, very difficult problem. And, and I, I have seen that, uh, some of the my fellow industries facing the same issue as well. Now, what have uh, the issue has been created uh, by removal of the toxic pesticide? Uh, it, it, it is it's very simple to, to say that, yes, we are going to reduce the, the chemical pesticide by X percent, but where is the solution to fill the gap in the market? I mean, this is a few slides I'm going to show you that this is a pest, uh, it's called the European crane fly is causing uh, millions in the UK turf industry. This is a normal here. So... Sorry for interruption. So this European crane fly is called causing millions uh, of damage to turf industry. And this is again the new pest. The problem happened when the chlorophyll was removed or banned in 2016. So you're seeing after a few years, a, a, a very much outbreak and causing serious problem. The sum of the golf course has been already closed in the UK. When we move to the other uh, example, this is basically happened uh, when adults swarming taking place, and then actually they will take everything out from the uh, from the field. As you see, this is a, the turf actually uh, is being eaten by this European crane fly. The other area, there is other pest is causing problem as well. You see, uh, uh, this is secondary damage caused by a chafer beetles, which actually cause damage to, uh, to to the same area as well. Now. This is a, a particular example is that the, the, the chemical which was removed in 2016 was used to, to control this pest, which we have seen a, again, very high uh, uh, population increase after chemical banned in the 2016. 
I think you are fully aware of this uh, uh, this pest, uh, which is the uh, fall army worms, and uh, it, there was a, some very hot spot news in the world, and this pest is causing very serious problem as well. I think you are also very much aware of the oak processory moth, which has recently become a serious problem in the UK market. Uh, although this pest is already causing a billion dollar uh, damage to the forestry, uh, especially. So these are some of the example I wanted to bring your attention. Uh, is that there is a serious problem industries uh, is, is facing. Uh, so what basically we can do and and how how we can go from here. So why the reform is, is, is taking place here. Uh, the first of all is that uh, uh, we have a Brexit opportunity which we want to utilize. Uh, uh, and we think that uh, uh, it's very much uh, uh, the, the, the way to, to start from this one uh, before even moving to the other country and, uh, and, and another uh, other area. The post-COVID actually has provided opportunity from the UK government point of view. Uh, is that uh, uh, where uh, the one of the speaker uh, is going to give more shade on this one? Uh, Green agenda is another uh, area where the which is funded by the industrial strategy plan. So all this basically is looking very good from the UK point of view, and we think that basically this is a good time uh, to to initiate this uh, this regulatory reform uh, change in the UK. Now, so. Uh, as, as you mentioned that uh, EU has done some of the work basically recently, and they are committed to remove 50% uh, of uh, pesticide, which is roughly 505 products by 2030. But the issue is that what is the strategy of how they are going to fill the gap in the market? Now, we also know that EU farm to fork strategy is actually is working very well. They also wants to increase 25% uh, uh, organic food production. So all this is actually is looking, looking very interesting. There is something mentioned in their, their documents is that EU is going to, uh, to, to have some plan and uh, by 2021 where they are going to make some change in biopesticide. But we haven't seen that one, what sort of things is going to have uh, in terms of the registration. As the registration is still the same as it was uh, uh, 10 years before, there is a little change has been done in this area. Now, so what the objective is going to be today is very much talking about a, 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 a reform and how this reform is going to take place. So uh, there is a vision uh, for successful regulatory system and then World Bioproduction Forum actually is taking lead and wants to, to act in this, uh, this area and looking for a starting point will be from the UK. Now, our idea is to basically first have a case study in the UK system as we think that uh, um, uh, that this is a this is the best place to start. Uh, there is an appetite. We have seen um, um, the consumer and uh, and uh, mainly basically they are they are they are basically using some product and they are looking for product to fill the gap where the chemical pesticide has been no longer available. So there will be rollout to the other country as well. We have already established um, a World Bio Production Forum India chapter. And we have a plan to go to other countries as well. So this is a, this is a very much a starting from this point, uh, and then moving forward to other country as well. Now, I will now basically hand over to to Sarah from here, and uh, and then I will hopefully come back later on. Hi. Well, um, it's just it's time to speak to and hear from Adrian Dixon who's the HSE Chemicals Regulation Division, is going to talk to us about pesticides regulation and biopesticides. Um, thank you, Sarah, and thanks for that very thought-provoking and challenging introduction, Midchad. Um, I think that sets the theme very nicely. Um, next slide, please. That's just my opening one. That's the standard HSE format, thanks. Um, so what I want to cover in my short presentation is just to give everybody an update on where we are on the legislation for um, pesticides and biopesticides post EU exit, um, then say a bit about what we've been doing over the years, and then look a bit more about the future, um, which hopefully then leads on to the other presentations. Next slide, please. Um, can you click through all the... Um, that's it. Brilliant. Um, this is just to show you, everybody, the overall framework for plant protection products legislation and biopesticides legislation. Um, we obviously have 
all of the legislation down the side, um, which has been retained in, in GB legislation now. So we have the authorization regulation 1107 um, and all that that entails for the, all the pre-marketing measures. Um, we have the sustainable use directive which introduces all the controls and the sustainable use legislation. It's all the controls on use of um, pesticides of whatever type, so training of operators, um, testing of equipment, requirements on integrated pest management and other measures there. And I'll say a bit more about those later on. And then at the end of the chain, um, there is all the legislation around um, residues, um, disposal of pesticides um, and water um, measures, things like that. Um, and then alongside the framework, there is still, um, we still do a lot of work around looking at what the impacts are and what the whole sort of um, progress is towards the sustainable use. So we have um, the pesticide usage surveys and um, sales surveys to actually see what's going on there. And then another framework across all that are obviously the um, enforcement controls, which will be coming in through the official controls regulation. So that, I think, gives you sort of the picture of how the legislation works end to end um, from the pesticide going through the authorization system to um, what happens to its constituent parts um, as it's been used and then degrades um, and uh, gets disposed of. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, what I'd like to do now is just highlight some of the legislative changes that came into force from the 1st of January, um, just so that everybody gets, the, again, the same picture of where we are and therefore what can be done at the moment. Um, so there's some, I, I won't read all the legislation in detail, but hopefully um, having them on the slides will mean that you have got the references if you need them. Um, so there is obviously a key statutory instrument, this is all secondary legislation, um, which changes the EU legislation into um, something that will work in a GB system. Um, it's probably worth flagging up, obviously, that all the um, EU legislation refers to EU institutions, um, so the European Commission, the European Food Safety Authority, etc., um, and the roles of other member states, and obviously there was a big piece of work in actually correcting all this, um, what was called lifting and shifting, um, all the EU legislation um, in pesticides and all the other areas that government operates in um, and turn it into a national system. And as you can imagine, that was quite a big piece of work. Um, and the only things that were allowed to do in that were actually fix um, any inoperabilities in the legislation rather than actually making any policy changes to the legislation itself. So there was no opportunity to change things from the EU system. So you've got um, a statutory instrument, which basically fixed 1107, um, another one which fixed the sustainable use directive um, and corrected some legislation there, and another one which fixed the pesticide maximum residue legislation. Um, so the three key planks of legislation there. Next slide, please. And then there were obviously further things that had to be done once we'd actually got the main bits of legislation um, sorted out. The EU was actually making decisions all the way along. So whilst we were introducing legislation um, in the last year or so um, across government and DEFRA, DEFRA led on sort of many of these pieces of legislation, um, but we were feeding in the technical expertise. Um, so there were other, other additional statutory instruments that had to be done. There was also, of course, the change of exit day. As you may recall, um, it was a bit of a movable feast. Um, so that had to be corrected as we went along. Um, and then there were also, at the sort of slightly later period, the addition of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which again has made changes because originally all the legislation was actually based um, taken into a, a UK system and now it sort of has to be GB um, with Northern Ireland still in the EU system and I'll say more about that in a moment. And then at the bottom of the slide as you'll see um, obviously even while all that was going on there were still EU regulations and things coming out um, that we have to catch up on so there will be a further statutory instrument 
um, laid later this year. And again, DEFRA is leading on that one. And that will pick up any EU decisions made up to the end of the transition period, i.e. to the end of last December. Um, so then we will have um, a complete package of transferred legislation um, on the statute books. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so just to give you a bit more detail about what, what we did with um, the various things on active substances and products. Um, again, some of you will know this, some of you may not. So, um, so we now have a statutory active substance register, which is published on our website. That's the sort of source of where all the active substances are held. We had to create that because obviously we're not part of the EU active substance register. Um, we're in the process of developing a GB review program so that we can actually um, take our own sort of review and I'll say a bit more about that shortly and but the, I think the main proviso is that whilst we haven't got a review program developed yet we can look at active substance approvals anytime um, if the EU takes action or if there is any new evidence that raises concerns that we weren't aware of before but in the time while we're actually developing our own review program for GB for all pesticides, we have extended those that were going to expire before December 2023. Um, so we gave a bit of sort of breathing space. Um, but obviously, it's in everybody's interest to try and get a review program developed as soon as we can. Um, so that industry in, in all areas has a certainty of what's going on and what, what they need to do. Next slide, please. So looking at an active substance program, um, as you would expect, we would want it to be um, effective, manageable and proportionate. Um, we've got to basically make sure that it doesn't take up more resources than, um, you know, that it actually makes sense. Um, and there is a number of ways that we could sort of approach things differently. Um, the legislation doesn't specify precisely um, how you do a review program. You will know that the EU has a chronological one, um, but obviously there are issues there in looking at sort of pesticides in chronological order, um, because you might suddenly, you know, um, review a pesticide, find it meets doesn't meet the standards, um, and then suddenly. Um, you will you will then sort of come along to another one which you find is actually more toxic than or more problematic than the previous one. Um, so there are issues around that sort of um, chronological approach. So there is scope here and we're thinking about whether how we can make use of assessments by other regulators so that we make our own decisions um, but we actually use work that's already been done in other places. Um, that, that could be a way of sort of easing burdens on um, those who are submitting applications or um, and certainly from our point of view as, as the regulator but the key emphasis is that um, GB is making its own decisions um, that's the critical point there so that's just gives you some thoughts around how um, you know, the type of things that we're looking at with the GB um, review program we'll obviously be consulting on how um, you know how we're going to do things so that'll be something for um, this sort of organisation, IBMA and others, to look out for. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we want to sort of use um, work that's already been done in other places. Um, so using assessments that have been made in other jurisdictions, obviously, um, primarily the main one that we know about at the minute is the anything that's done in the EU. Um, but we need to look at these things on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and at the moment, our standards are obviously the same as the EU. Um, and ministers are very keen to maintain and increase standards where possible. Um, so, as I say, we need to look at other things that are being done. We need to um, get views from applicants as to why other information from other jurisdictions are valid. Um, and, as I said earlier on, we could use assessments from other jurisdictions to support a GB application, we wouldn't necessarily rely on them. And at the end of the day, they would all be GB decisions that we made on applications. Next slide, please.
We're looking at product authorizations and product application process. Um, anything that's been authorized in the UK before the transition period continues to be valid in GB in Northern Ireland. Obviously, author authorizations are now have to specify whether they're GB authorizations or Northern Ireland only authorizations or both. So there's a bit of um, increased complexity there. Um, and an important point is that um, applicants for product authorization now need authorization under both GB and Northern Ireland regimes to get access to both markets. Um, but on the plus side, we're not changing any, or we haven't changed any of the data requirements or um, how the, the format that the data comes in. Um, so we try to keep things um, as consistent as we can for applicants. Um, and you know, particularly as Minch had said in this area, um, you've got sort of SMEs. So we're very mindful of the burdens on applicants. Next slide, please. Um, there's a bit more detail around the product author application process. Again, um, we'll try and maintain the map numbers on the products the same, keep common labeling where we can, but obviously there will be divergences um, occurring because of if we take a different decision um, to the EU, if expiries dates to active substances change, um, if we make a different a decision at a different time to the EU, um, things are going to get sort of um, out of sync as it were. And of course this divergence will impact on the conditions of authorizations, the data protection periods and the map numbers. So again, the, there are sort of things to watch out for there. Next slide, please. So I think the, the main headlines that I'd like to give people around this sort of legislation, legislative process is that, you know, we've obviously now got a new independent pesticides regulatory regime in Great Britain. Um, we're taking responsibility for our own decisions um, using our own rules. All existing active substance approvals, um, PP authorizations and maximum residue levels continue to be valid. Um, so, as I said earlier, everything retains their current expiry dates. Um, active substances have been rolled over, and we and all the MRLs remain valid until they're amended. But the key, another key point, is the bit in bold at the bottom, which basically Northern Ireland is still following the EU rules because of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, so we're having to operate that sort of separate system for Northern Ireland. Next slide, please. And just a quick bit around MRLs, as I said, that existing MRLs continue. Um, we'll set MRLs based on our own assessments. New MRL applications will be continue to be submitted in a similar format. And again, we won't be changing the data requirements or the format um, for information for applications, which again, I think is important to um, applicants to actually know what's going on there. Next slide, please. And again, just a bit more around how we'll be implementing MRLs. Um, we're gonna publish all the decision documents just like the EU system does. So there'll be plenty of things to look out for. Um, we have a statutory register of MRLs. So rather than the commission's way of um, pushing out um, and legislation and putting a regulation out every time, um, we would have been faced with having to do a um, piece of legislation every time an MRL changed, um, which would obviously be sort of very bureaucratic and not very fleet of foot for um, food industry and other operators. Um, so we've got this statutory register. And again, we will be implementing a formal MRL review program um, and trying to tie the MRL sort of reviews in with the active substance reviews, trying to make things run a lot more um, in, in parallel rather than um, sequential, as it were. Next slide, please. I'd just like to say a bit about the UK biopesticide scheme as well, well just to um, folks who haven't come across it know what's, what we've been trying to do. Um, it's been in place for a little while from the pilot in 2003 um, and covers all the areas listed on the slide. Um, it started in 2006, we reviewed it in 2013, and we're obviously, um, as I'll highlight later on, effectively looking at, at another review now. Um, the main aim of it was trying to make sure that we had sort of um, dialogues with applicants, um, that we sort of helped applicants through the 
um, process as best we could. Um, we have a biopesticides champion, Lisa Mokes, who um, would have been here today, but unfortunately has other commitments. Um, and there is also reduced fees for the biopesticide scheme, so the government sort of um, funds some of that. And we try and give sort of as much sort of free advice as we can around the biopesticides area with the aim of increasing biopesticide availability in the UK. Um, from our point of view, learning more about the sector and developing expertise. Um, as I say, encouraging dialogue from applicants um, and so on and so forth. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so let us say that just sets out what I said around increasing biopesticide availability. And as the graph that Minchad had at the start showed that sort of biopesticide availability has gone up over the years, um, but only at a sort of steady rate um, rather than the sort of rate that the gaps are developing in other parts of the crop protection armory, I think is um, the way I would summarise it. Um, so yeah, so that's that's what we're still trying to do with the biopesticide scheme. Um, and again, as I say, I would encourage anybody who has any questions around sort of how our biopesticide scheme works or what's, what can be done um, to contact Lisa and her team. Um, and as I say, we have put a lot of effort into that over the years. Next slide, please. I think another thing I would stress is that we are, as a regulator, open to innovation. Um, Again, that applies across HSE, not just in the chemicals area. We recognise, you know, that the regulatory system shouldn't stifle innovation. Um, but we also need to recognise that it's a complex multifactorial regulatory environment um, and the requirements evolve. We've got to maintain high standards of protection uh, for human health and the environment. And we've got to maintain a high level of confidence in the regulatory regime um, for both you know, users, consumers, um, everybody who's involved. Um, so we have to be satisfied that the products we authorise meet these standards. Um, but as I say, we also continually um, look at sort of inwards, as it were, and say, you know, what are the barriers here? Um, you know, what is, and we also look outwards and say, what is happening in the world? Um, you know, what is changing? And we have lots of discussions and indeed sort of have a, a, a small unit who actually look more at the sort of forward thinking stuff um, within the pesticides area as well. Next slide, please. I just thought I'd also quickly cover some of the sustainable use um, angle of biopesticides. <laughs> The top bullet sets out what the sustainable use legislation is trying to do. Obviously, we're trying to reduce the risks and impacts of pesticide use on health and the environment and promote the use of IPM and alternative approaches or techniques. Um, as Minchad said, um, the changes in the EU regulation have done the first bit of that quite well in terms of um, removing sort of the um, chemicals with sort of high risks to health and the environment, um, but not done quite so well yet on the, um, what, what, what plugs the gap, um, you know, particularly around lower risk products, you know. So there's an awful lot still to be done there in terms of making sure that the chemicals that are there are used um, properly and safely and that they, you know, all meet the standards. Uh, which let's say we have the regulatory system to do that. But there's also um, the need for sort of this continual look across the piece as to what's available for crop protection or even, um, as Minchad said, you know, not just crop protection, we're into sort of amenity protection um, and all these wider things where um, chemicals and non-chemicals are used. The sustainable use legislation sets out the key areas for national actions and it does stress the importance of biopesticides and low risk substances. I think that's the key thing there is seeing the biopesticides um, part alongside the low risk substances and how they sort of work together there. Um, I suppose there are other drivers as well around um, resistance management as well, um, conventional chemicals, because there are fewer and fewer that are um, available then there is also a need for some changes in mode of action, um, different ways of attacking, different ways of delivering um, you know, existing 
chemicals to the to the target, as it were. Um, so there's a lot to be a lot going on in uh, what needs to be done in that area. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, as Minchan said at the start, there are a lot of drivers for um, change now. Um, Minchan mentioned the, the Build Back Better. Um, there are a whole plethora of uh, strategies, you know, all four um, government departments have environment strategies. So, you know, in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, there are um, issues around net carbon strategies um, and other government strategies that all need to come together um, and that give this constant this driver um, for improving things, um, you know, maximizing availability of um, products for use um, on pests, weeds and diseases. So at the end of last year, um, as part of the sustainable use measures, DEFRA on behalf of the four administrations um, led a national action plan consultation. So basically to try and produce a new way forward to fit with as part of the commitment in the 25 year um, environment plan and again that has a, a high level aim of minimizing risks and impacts to health and the environment whilst ensuring pests in the broadest sense um, and pesticide resistance are managed effectively that consultation um, ended at the end of february um, and i say the, the the aims or the goals rather are set out there. There was a goal around re robust regulation, um, a particular emphasis on the development and uptake of IPM um, and safe and sustainable use of pesticides and reduction of risks uh, by improving metrics and indicators, which is a, a big piece of work again, including the 25 year environment plan and a way of sort of an, an emphasis on government working with others. It's not something that government can do in isolation delivering sustainable use of pesticides is something that government needs to work with partners um, in all different areas. So as I say, that was the UK wide and developed in conjunction with all four administrations um, and the responses have been analysed um, with an aim of producing a revised national action plan um, by the end of the year sort of timing. Um, but so that, so that will be an interesting thing to watch out for. Next slide, please. I just thought I'd flag up um, a couple of things out of the National Action Plan consultation itself. Um, there was a commitment to continue to implement the biopesticide scheme and to look at how to expand and improve it. Um, and also trying to get um, users to get the advice they need to be confident in their use. There was also a commitment to review the results of the HDB funded projects um, and to improve the performance of biopesticide products and to speed up the process of testing and bringing new pesticide products to market. Next slide, please. And a, a specific NAP question which was left um, was basically what actions could be taken to expand and improve the current biopesticide scheme to increase the availability of approved products and better support potential users. So I think that question is really what this um, forum is particularly trying to do. So uh, uh, next slide, please. So I think that's, that's a summary of, we've got an independent GB regime. We've got, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna. <laughs> Didn't. Um, right, sorry about that. Um, so we've got an independent GB pesticides regulatory regime. We've got responsibility for active substances and MRL decisions repatriated. Um, all the regulatory standards have been maintained. We're carrying on as the regulator and we continue to work on developing guidance, etc. There's an obviously an increase in role of biopesticides and the NAP consultation, which hopefully um, many of you will have fed into um, where you're in this country, particularly um, bodies like IBMA, um, and I suspect a number of others on this um, seminar will have also done the same. Um, so I think it's a very timely um, discussion that you've um, organised, um, and as I say, we'll, I'll look forward to hearing the, the other presentations um, and 
see you know, seeing what thoughts come out of that. Um, that should be the end slide. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you, Adrian. That was that was a great overview, very comprehensive and actually very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone has any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as we can in the Q&A session later. But we need to push on with the presentations now. And so now I'm very pleased to welcome Jennifer Lewis, who's executive director of the IBMA and who is providing us with a vision of a successful regulatory framework. Over to you, Jennifer. 